Sorry, we're just testing the audio. Is it okay? We are having some audio hiccups. We are trying to resolve that. I hope this works. Any luck? The blink of the thing. Contact red. The online audio is not, uh, people are waiting on that side, so. These two years we thought we mastered uh, online talks, but uh, it doesn't seem to be so. Uh, good evening. Okay. Uh, this talk is going to be from a historian's point of view, not from a scientist's point of view. Yeah, I'll try to be loud. Uh, this is from a historian's point of view. 20th century technology has completely and irreversibly changed the way people live, interact, learn, work, play, pray, and do business. The one factor, the driving factor behind this is innovation. And no other century in our entire history of mankind has been driven by innovation as its last gen. The word innovation, to start with it, comes from the Latin verb innovare, which means to renew, which is very true because innovation and invention are not same. You can invent, but you can improve. That improvement part is what is innovation. For example, when the cycle was invented, uh, one uh, incredibly important trivia is that the car was invented before the cycle. So we do, it doesn't go by that order. Cycle one, then you have to go to a motorbike, then you have to go to an auto, then you have to come to a car. They were happening simultaneously. When this was happening, the rickshaw, the car and the cycle were being worked on simultaneously and the rickshaw was more prestigious than the car. Either in, in parts of Asia, the richest people had rickshaws and the car was not making an entry. 
so improve innovation means to improve or to replace something a product a process or a service today people are being complimented saying you're very innovative company or innovative organization so invention has all but dropped out of the business nobody's talk about talking about invention these days in business there come quite a few reasons because uh, they both are not same they were same for some time say a very little, little part of history quite some time ago the last invention made by a single person was perhaps a television adukapra everything has been only teams so that the aura surrounding that absent minded professor who is a uh, inventor also has vanished now people are team of people work on something so that that scientist that the common the the comic character of the scientist that we see in movies of the 50s 40s has just vanished next one innovation let's change the next slide next slide it is the ability to see change as an opportunity not as a threat 90% of time innovation is seen as threat as a threat uh if you look at the things that have been banned bicycles have been banned books have been banned uh even today chess is banned in 15 countries we learned that when the uh, the olympiad was happening 15 countries have banned chess so it's seen as a menace a new technology defy hegemonies and eliminate a type of livelihood say for example we used to have painters of the uh the banners once this new type of printing the vinyl printing came that entire livelihood vanished so many things can happen like that uh, or empower a section of society any technology which has empowered women has always been looked at with a suspicious eye has been the bicycle was banned as a instrument of the devil because women could cycle here and there so this has happened in several countries next one invention is not innovation they are very close you could call them cousins the next one the point is uh, is innovation good or bad we look at this we will talk about this man later this man won the first cycle competition in the world but he cheated he cheated and won the cheating was a innovation which is helping all of us today we are going to look at it later i'm just telling you innovation can be looked at as cheating at one point of time Uh, is innovation good or bad and this is the television this is the first show that happened on the television left one it was a puppet show they are testing out the television and this is the left one was the and that is the first prototype of a television the next one right techno advances how many hotel rooms does airbnb hold how many hotels does swiggy run or how many uh, uh, rooms that uh, oyo runs as well and how many cars that uber have zero they are all building their first enterprises right now but one technology internet internet could make them the largest supplier of food or the largest hirer of rooms or the largest hotel in the world so this is what typically techno technology and innovation means that a um, improvement on an existing technology to use it to serve an, an absent activity or an absent service so the raja ji has a, always a very good way of uh, describing things so when radio is introduced under his chief ministership he says it is like a bullock cart which takes people from place to place it rather takes sound instead of a bullock cart so raja ji also talks about hindi imposition as chutney on your plate take it or leave it so raja ji always had that but when he was opening the first train from madras to trichy inaugurating the first train people asked people are to people who were talking about trichy getting uh improvements by leaps and bounds because of this one train raja ji said what if 30 robbers get on the first train or 30 pickpockets get on the first train crime is going to go up in trichy so what we are talking about is a vehicle we are not talking about good or bad innovation is exactly that the people who gain most from innovation are crime and war warfare and crime will always adopt any innovation first before it even comes to people so basically uh this one the next one please like the dodo or the dinosaur the typical word today is the dodo or the dinosaur the dodo was in madagascar island for a million years it lo- it didn't forgot how to fly because it has no enemies the moment a ship load of sailors came and introduced a couple of dogs and a couple of cats which ate up their eggs or ate up the birds the dodo actually went extinct in a year it took one year for us to make a uh, species extinct 
So that is exactly what will happen today if people don't innovate. Luckily for the common people, I don't think innovation is uh, needed as much as for companies or organizations. But if they don't, that's what's going to happen to them. So intention is not very important in uh, innovation. It can be accidental. Your penicillin was uh, accidental. Your x-rays were accidental. Your microwave was accidental. A scientist in a physics lab has a chocolate bar in his pocket. And he's working with some uh, uh, cathode ray tube or something of the sort. But uh, his, the chocolate in his pocket melts. Immediately, they innovate and make a, a stove out of it or the microwave. This is one invention that can make fire extinct. Fire is one of the oldest inventions of man, innovations of man. Fire could go in, uh, extinct because of a microwave or an electric cooker. The next one. Not everybody has to. This is a picture. Anybody knows what this is? A parachute invented by Da Vinci. The problem, he invented it before the plane came. What do you use a parachute for if you don't have a plane? But he marked it. How many inventions have gone unnoticed or unwritten because they didn't find a use? Da Vinci had that forethought to think that this will be of use someday. So he marked it in this one as codex. But the point was, how many inventions have been lost to us because people did not record it, because people did not have a use on that day? Next one. Scientists can invent. People can wear their white coats and go to the lab, work for 10 years and uh, invent. Housewives can also invent. Both these things are very important inventions. One is the churning of the ice cream. I, uh, the person who is above 50 will know this. We used to have these churners in the wedding halls where they used to churn, they used to put uh, uh, ice and uh, uh, salt on the outside and uh, cream in the, in, the, in the middle. And invariably, the salt would get into the ice cream. So you can never have uh, uh, them apart. And this is a garbage can which is opened by pressing by the foot. How hygienic it is. Only a housewife could have invented that. A scientist would never even think of this. So this was invented by a housewife. So as I was telling, uh, saying earlier, rickshaws and cars were being simultaneously innovated. And rickshaws were far ahead. People were trying to make more innovations to rickshaws than cars. The 1800s were full of this. And the cycle also joined the race. Localized inventions. This is one of my favorites. Uh, Idli grinder will never get a Nobel Prize. It will not even be heard of beyond India. But how much drudgery it has removed. I am sure Idli would have gone extinct. But for this, you can't have a woman who is going to work or who is going to be a homemaker or going to go take her children to tuitions making Idlis daily. Idli is one of the most complicated menus in our uh, uh, cuisine. In fact, those days, the Idlis were made only on Diwali days. I, we had a, a friend's house, uh, a boy had come from the village to work as a servant and they gave him idlis on the first day and he started crying. And he said, Nengi urla Diwali da So the idlis are so, it's too so tough to make idli on a normal day without a grinder. But this is also going to, extinct, going to go extinct because people are selling the idli batter. That's the next step. If you're going to have, you, you don't have a cow because the milk is supplied to you. You don't need a grinder if the idli batter is going to be supplied to you. So that is obviously the next step. People always assume there are two sort thoughts that industrialization removed slavery and not Lincoln. But technically, if you see that Lincoln abolished slavery in 1865 and the tractor comes to replace the slaves in 10 years. So the abolition of the slavery is what induced the invention of the tractor. But then people got so fascinated with the tractor that they didn't go back to slavery. So they made sure the next president came also, he didn't, the slavery was no longer economical. Next one. Social change, both old and new, commonly assume the course of social change is not arbitrary, but to a certain degree, regular and pattern. You can see the same innovation coming back again and again or going for good or having some improvement. So the first is decline. This is the old ice house. The British were getting really homesick for England and ice was transported from England, uh, from USA, Massachusetts, Boston. Ice used to come all the way across the equator twice and if you load 120 tons of ice, only 80 tons would come. And they used to store it in ice houses all over Asia, all over Central America. Uh, one person, Tudor, was doing it. But then one machine was invented, ice maker, which is the precursor of your uh, refrigerator. And his business became bankrupt. There were almost thousands of people working on that industry, the ice supply to the tropics. But it stopped one day after the ice machine was invented. The next one. The last, if you identify, is the radio. It's so tough to own a radio. We went through the cycle like this. 
there were only 10 radios in madras uh, four of them were on the beach if you wanted to listen to songs or if you wanted to hear news that is i'm talking about the 40s that crowd is there for to hear of the news about gandhi's death there are rumors and there were 10000 people assembled in madras beach to hear the news that one loud speaker and getting a radio for santom beach is a news that comes in the newspaper they are going to buy a radio for santom radio santom this and radio is still on advertising in papers on what programs it's daily so then radios became so common and cheap especially after that vgp revolution even uh, there used to be a joke that even uh, the narikorwas used to own uh, transistors and then people thought once the television came the radio would go away that's what everybody assumed but now the radio is as popular as the television you watch your television on your uh, uh, ipad in uh, one of these uh, websites but uh, the radio you always listen on your car so the radio today is more popular than the uh, television which was supposed to have replaced it next one this is another typical cycle fingerprint became the signature and the signature has now become the fingerprint so things go in a circle we assume that uh, innovations are there to stay but they keep going around and around as a typical almost you, you tell your children don't uh, we were telling our children don't uh, use the cell phone don't play and these two years we had to sell, tell them to use the cell phone for everything uh, people used to say don't use your cell phones in your uh, petrol bunks but they, they ask you to pay on the uh, uh, phone then basically that uh, innovations are going to keep changing the next one the pottery wheel perhaps man's first greatest invention we are going to talk in detail about this the pottery wheel uh changed mankind like no other innovation you can't it's very rare to see we had a kosopet and kosovan and people we had separate areas in madras where these people were very active till 1960s but the pottery wheel changed innovation for the good not just as a container but from that other innovations led to something like even the space shuttle today next one so fire was the greatest innovation of man man was afraid of fire but there is a psychology today people are arsonists people want to burn down things and when somebody conquers conquers a country they want to burn it down to the ground it has happened to the cholas the pandyas the vijayanagar empire <laughs> they conquer they loot and then they want to burn it down there is an inherent uh, a fear of fire which they want to use as a weapon something that we have inherited from the uh, evolution from an animal or a ape so don't play with fire is something we teach the children its impact on human evolution is fantastic at the mindset the discovery of fire came to provide a wide variety of uses for early hominids the control of fire enabled them to have important changes in human behavior health energy and geographic expansion people were able to modify environment for the first time man was getting the strength to change the land that he was living in he was such a small person before he got control over the fire next one first they started migrating to we have learned that uh, social distancing is very good for health in this last two years so when the population spread over to a larger area they didn't get too many diseases they had more land to uh, cultivate more things to look forward to so anything that supported migration is good technology so fire was the first they could move into the subtropics they could move even to the arctics the moment they learned to control fire they started moving into the cooler regions next one safety from wild animals which is very very important for them uh there was a, a statistics professor in mcc called gifts romani his website is available on the he is a statistics professor but he writes a lot about history uh, it's still available on the his website is available on the uh, net he used to say where to go and find caveman tools he asked us to look always in places between the hill and the water a lot of these places you can find in vandalur belt in tambaram belt there will be a hill and there will be a water and there will be a few acres of land in the middle if you go there invariably you will come back with a caveman axe because the man caveman would go up the hill in the night he was afraid of the animals but he also needed to be close to the water so this the proximity to higher te- territory or caves or something that protected him from animals was uh, this entire aura of that uh, being away from animals was destroyed by the control of fire some days back some years back in the same forum we had a talk on uh, the periyar dam how as recent as 1870 they used to have camps to build the periyar dam and the tiger used to come in the night and audaciously take away one of the workers it was happening till last century so the fear for animals even today there's a fear for snakes 
So fire was something that frightened the animals. So that was very, very important for man and his survival. We are taught in school that, we are taught very wrong things in school, but we are taught in school that you make fire with flint stones. You should try making fire with a flint stone. It's next to impossible. Our spark, you just can't catch it. The way most people did fire, uh, origination of the fire was the fire drill. You have a model of this in the Madras Museum. People still use it for uh, religious functions. When they don't want to use your phosphorus for your matchstick, they have a fire drill. So this man had a crude fire drill. You just make a hole in a piece of log, put in a stick and roll it with his hands. He didn't know the pulley system. He would roll it with his hands till there was enough friction there which could catch fire. I mean, the, at least the hay that he put it on could catch fire. Next one. This is one important development of fire. When they used fire on rocks, they flaked. Used to the triangular pieces like that, which could be used as arrowheads. The target of hunting or warfare is to do it from as far away as possible. Man was fighting with his hands, then with clubs, then he came to bow and arrow. This was the first time he could kill an animal at 30 feet or 40 feet without putting himself to danger. This is the phenomenon that has led to your intercontinental ballistic missile. You can throw a, a missile from Russia to America or America to Russia without being in danger. So this fighting from a distance started when he got an idea of the small triangular stones that flaked off from rock when fires were lit or when forest fires hit those areas. Tool making, of course. And then a lot of things changed for him with light. The same thing that happened with the bulb, say 5,000 years later or 10,000 years later. Your day elongated. Your sleep patterns changed. Most mammals keep awake only for 8 hours. Man came to somewhere intermediate between 8 to 16 when the fire was invented. So he has having more waking hours, more utility, more utility, think, more time to think about something progressive. And people had to gather around fires. So society formed. They had to communicate with each other. So language formed. There are many things which basic, at least rudimentary, these things were happening. Effect on sleep and the cooking hypothesis. Man could eat a lot more food after cooking. Raw, you can't eat meat. Uh, you will have to cook it. And your the, the 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 his food, the plate was filled with more things the moment he got control of his fire. These things actually gave him more nutrients and his first his molars changed, the teeth changed because he has to bite a different sort of things. And then there is some scientific evidence that the brain enlarged, the cranium enlarged. This could be the quantum leap that man became a superman. But there is a lot of disagreement on this theory as well, saying that the brain has been progressively grow, uh, growing and not after the invention of fire. We normally tabulate control of fire to say 4000 BC, but we do get evidences of cook hearths or cooking of fires, uh, remnants of those fires, way back to 120,000 years. So it, people must have been doing it differently at different spots of time. Next one. The quality and variety of food changed. He stopped, people stopped dying of bad food. Cooking took them away from uh, food poisoning. Uh, in a sense that, how many blue foods do you know? Very rare. Uh, Pepsi made a blue drink and it flopped also. Because the, the typical story of Nilakanta, Shiva follows the poison and his neck becomes blue. Every poison in those days in came and times was blue. So man always avoided anything blue because they were poisons. He had learned. It's a, it's a question of survival. And cooking stopped a lot of these poisoning events. Food spoiled also did not really harm him. Next one. Because he was eating meat, he started herding animals. He started domesticating animals. The last animal I think domesticated was the camel or something in 7000 BC. But till then, there was a lovely experiment in Soviet Russia where they wanted to domesticate the fox, the Arctic fox. They were inbreeding the, the more gentle of the foxes to make a pet. Uh, but then by the time they got the enough... Uh, uh, genesis uh, out of that uh, Russia had collapsed and so this experiment was stopped. There's a lovely article about it in uh, National Geographic. I think the, the fox would have been the last animal to have been tamed if they had been successful. But herding of animals, domestic of animals started only after the fire came in. So the next question is fire becoming extinct. Man's first invention, invention which we still hold to, uh, dear today might become extinct in another 100 years when a fire might become a real hazard to have within the house. There are many things that, for example, the light bulb. Light bulb spends 95% of its energy making heat and not light. So that's why people want to ban it now. 
uh, that's why we are going for CFLs. So the fire might also get banned some point in our history when electricity and other forms of heat take over, perhaps solar, perhaps electricity. Next one. The wheel, something that we hold close even today, uh, perhaps the first invention that has remained with us uh, without major innovations. We, the shape hasn't changed, the axle part hasn't changed. Of course, we are clothing it with rubber or doing it with other materials, but the utility has also not changed. This is one of the oldest wheels in a museum. It's from Mesopotamia. Uh, it's in, I think it's in London Museum as usual. But the wheel was not invented for the vehicle. It was not invented for moving around. It was invented for pottery. Next one. Of course, they had a lot of problems uh, transporting things. The, the, this was the method that they built the pyramids with. This was the thread that they used. You had to pull it along the sand. But of course, slavery increased because you didn't have the wheel. The wheel might, might have reduced the need for slaves at some point of time. Next one. In spite of all that, in spite of this huge 1.5 ton or 2 ton stones being uh, pulled by a sled on sand for nearly 15-20 kilometers, people did not invent the wheel or they could not invent the wheel. Material management was always a problem. So, strong enough to hold a big uh, lump of stone was a problem. So, the pottery wheel. So, you might ask, what is so big about a single pot? So, let us say you do not have water and the only water source in this building is 200 meters away. Every time you get thirsty, which is about 6 or 7 times a day, you have to walk there, drink water and come back. So, your houses are within 200 meters of a water body. You do not become bigger than that. They were of course making pots earlier than that using that uh, thread method. Uh, I have a sample of that. The one on the left bottom. They used to make a coil of uh, clay and have it sun dried. But they could make 3 or 4 a day and the pottery will change all that. Pottery will change it and so that it could make hundreds of pots in a day. People could settle further down. People could go on hunting expeditions. People could stay over at outside. And it enlarged the territory that man was holding by 10 times, 20 times. That is one of the earliest pots. We are getting uh, samples in archaeology of pots or shreds of pots which are nearly 100,000 years old. So that we can't assume that the pottery wheel was invented only in Mesopotamia. There is a school of thought which also says Mesopotamia, all this was invented for beer. Uh, their beer, fa beer uh, the, the farms that they had and the factories that they had for make beer is supposed to have innovated many things. One was storage, the next was mathematics. They had to have accounting. Next was writing down accounts. Lots of innovations like that. So this is the theory I'm having. Say so let's say 100 meters. He has to move further than 100 meters because he has a pot. The early wheel was like this. It's a very, very old wheel. I think it's a Celtic wheel. Uh, it was heavy. It was as heavy as the vehicle itself. So it was very, almost next to, it was as good as not having it. And the spokes, it took another 2,000, 3,000 years to make the spokes on the wheels. The Romans perfected it. Simple chariot racing. If you look at Ben-Hur, you'll know uh, their, uh, the chariots were racing fast. They had to make it lighter. So the spokes were invented. So something as... Uh, as normal as a sport can become really because the spokes that in a cycle we just have a, a rod, a small rod. So that bears the entire weight of a person. The next one is, of course, metallurgy. Man controlled metal and he controlled the world. Metals have shaped history, magnifying their efforts, easing lives, creating empires. The man who controlled metals had the first empires in the world. Over a period of thousands of years, Humans learn to identify, extract, blend and shape metals into tools and weapons. The first metal that man identified was the most useless, gold. Uh, gold, uh, he found was, uh, gold is almost natural in the uh, real reality, in the natural sense. It doesn't really have a ore where you have to purify. So he could find streams of ore and it's perhaps the oldest uh, innovation of man to retain its importance today. Gold is still as important as today as it was in standard. It's absolutely no use. I think there's some use in astronomy where they use it in some uh, the spacecraft. But other than that, I don't think gold has any use. Bronze, of course, was the first metal, uh, first alloy at least. Man controlled copper as soon as he got uh, gold because copper and gold always come together in the same ores. And it was too brittle to be cold hammered. They were not getting really a great equipment, but this was any day better than a wooden club. The man who was having a sword was any day better off in a war field than somebody who was having a wooden uh, 
the club but this also though it was very malleable this would break in the wharf and uh, its vessels vessels made of brass could leak this changed life never before the stone age was gone once for all uh, there are parallel uh, i wouldn't say if one civilization is uh, inventing the aeroplane the next uh, civilization cannot be doing a chariot there some parallel so we have some parallelism in the innovation so bronze was almost there in all either through warfare or trade they were exchanged and making bronze was mastered and then came steel so when they went to iron it was a next ladder on metallurgy and the man dominance of bronze ended production of iron a harder and a stronger material a breakthrough occurred when they were the coking the type of melting they were doing and finally the durable version of steel a carbon iron alloy the steel which is almost not changed except for the percentage of nickel nickel added or the chromium added is not changed the iron age lasted for 1000 years that should tell you how much importance there is when things are changing over uh, every 100 years or 50 years the iron age lasted for 1000 years because iron was very very important and the impact was empire building better weaponry and wars were won only on innovation of metals making better swords better arrows and uh, the roman empire was built india was very high in uh, uh, weapon making uh, especially in steel we have steel thing uh, we have steel uh, monuments which have not rusted even today after 3000 years this was approximately the movement of the roman empire entire world started to be on a flux the moment steel was mastered uh, people started uh, conquering each other we have the huns the attilas uh, atlas uh, uh, vandals coming in the the romans going out and you can see the hannibal going in or the vandals coming in so everybody was in a state of flux having a warfare uh, long before the printing press came writing was the important way of storing information say there were repositories uh, like we have stories of uh, the devaram being in the chidambaram temple so they were stored in public places mostly monasteries in europe or temples in india the next one the monasteries also had something called a scriptorium scriptorium was a very important it's like typically your carbon paper so if you give them a book they will copy it for you the monks would do it they were of course they made errors and these errors got magnified when the, repeatedly they were copied you should also realize uh, this typical story about uvesa uvesa is meeting a uh, sponsor called mudaliyar uh, who is being referred to by the adinam and uh, mudaliyar asks him what you have read he talks about villi bharatam he talks about kambara mainam and mudaliyar asks him have you read silapadigaram the typical answer of uh, uvesa of course nobody else was in the meeting but this is what people generally says apdina what is that what is silapadigaram this happened in 1892 125 years back because all your uh, kavyangal were on uh, palm leaf scripts they had to be copied once in 50 years so uvesa and uh, the mudaliya they get the entire script of uh, silapadigaram and get it printed there were people who knew christian missionaries knew uh, 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 uvesa knew that the print the permanence can come only when you print it otherwise there is no uh, logic in searching for all these things next one the printing press was one of the perhaps the greatest i two of the greatest inventions of mankind was one was the printing press the other was social media social media or internet they got together people like anything nothing before gutenberg who invented this was a goldsmith and he struck gold like an alchemist he was just dreaming about something when he got this idea and ironically uh, he was thinking about the churches being his great, greatest market i'll print bibles for the church and become a rich man or something but actually he destroyed the church by doing the uh, the printing press so innovation can take its own turn as i said there's nothing good or bad about it so this is the gutenberg bible one of the most expensive after perhaps da vinci's book this perhaps the codex this is one of the most expensive uh, collector items in the world so the first things that he printed was the 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 bible there were not other books anywhere if you look at it closely there are no there's no prose in tamil even up before 1890 because there's no printing who would write such a 1000 page novel on a palm leaf and keep it for somebody to read so the printing press actually in uh, inspires a lot of people to write prose as well as poetry 
uh, I will just give you information about this. Uh, this Bible had 42 lines in every page. Uh, he sold 180 copies. So the first great book printed on a printing uh, press sells uh, 180 copies. Of course, Martin Luther uses this printing press to print his own uh, uh, details. And that sells, Martin Luther is perhaps the biggest, first big se best seller of the world. Um, perhaps more than a thousand copies. I think he's the best seller. Next one. Martin Luther, who made maximum use of the printing press uh, to change the world. Or at least he showed the world that the world can be changed. The biggest uh, side effect of this was the vernacular languages. Most of these would have gone extinct if there was no printing press. Tamilus was perhaps the first Indian language to be printed. One of the earliest, though it was printed in Goa. Our first printing press came in the 1600s in Porayar, near Tarangambadi. It was in the 1600s. So books have been printed here for a, quite a long time. And all this adds up to uh, or an outlier uh, theory when you see your high up in the indexes this is. I always ask them, there are 75 grandmasters in India, 35 of them are in Madras. We must be doing something right. We don't have chess classes in school. We don't have them make it compulsory as they made it in Soviet Russia. But how come 35 teenagers go and beat world champions? So we are doing something right. All these are outlier principles. We have been having printed books for 400 years. We have been reading English for 300 years. We have been doing mathematics for 250 years. We have a very rich heritage for 5,000 years. So all this adds up to your children. We have some future to look up to. So we are doing something right. Though we have not placed the finger on that, we have done doing something right. A big uh, boost, this Copernicus, big boost was for science. The biggest, uh, uh, let's say, the printing press made changes because people could print their own theories. They could have it read by other scientists. So he was talking about uh, breaking the heliocentric. Uh, he was putting forward the heliocentric theory that we were going around the sun and not around the, the sun was not going around us. But if he had spoken, only spoken about that without having a mass support, he would have been burnt on the stake. He could get 1,000, 2,000 people ready to read that theory and some of them agreeing to it wholeheartedly. That was his insurance. So a lot of these scientists like Copernicus had a, are remembered today because of the printing press. So starting from Bibles, it becomes books and then it becomes uh, newspapers. No, no, newspapers are becoming extinct. How many of you read newspapers today? What news we want to read? We read it on the internet. So everything, we, everybody, when they invented the newspaper or the peak of the newspaper 1900s, we would have thought that it was going to go on forever and ever. Nothing lasts forever. So the printing press as it is, has changed so much from the screw press that he had. We can, we can print a book on the computer today. Next one. The biggest uh, effect of history, on history today, is colonialism. We got a lot of their ideas. We got a lot of their uh, uh, technically, uh, say, evil. And we lost a lot of wealth or we learned something. So, there were gives and takes in colonialism. Colonialism depended on shipbuilding. There were no planes. People, there was no Suez Canal. People had to come around the Cape of Good, ha uh, Cape of Good Hope and... Uh, uh, come over to India or the Far East or the Indies. So, 50% of your ships never went back. 70% of your men never went back. And But they could colonize a big part of Asia. So, what were the innovations in shipbuilding that allowed them suddenly to take over the world? Next one. First, you needed a lot of ships. Making ships was a very complicated business. You would have to have 500 to 1000 pieces of log assembled in with nails or uh, rope to make a ship. This is an in India man. These are the number of ships that an artist visualizes outside Madras or uh, Goa. This is the pit soy. Uh, one person would be standing inside a pit or on the lower level. And the other person would, with the help of gravity, be pushing the uh, saw. It is a very tough process. People will not live longer and they do not have a uh, too many uh, planks of wood to make a ship. So let us assume that England was making 50 ships and uh, per year and France was making 50 ships. Netherlands was also making 50 ships. Suddenly in a year, Netherlands makes 1,500 ships. A 3,000 uh, percentage increase on ships. They come over, they take over South Africa, they take over Indonesia, they take over... They came to Madras ahead of the Portuguese and even the British. Your Cedras and your uh, uh, Pulikat, they came ahead. How are they making 1,500 ships in a year? People sent spies. They wanted to check it out. 
they had invented something it's not an invention it was innovation it was already existing the water mill oriented uh, uh, grain grinding was already there somebody linked it with the saw the typical cat cam the next one you see it in railway engines even today in railway engines it is uh, a vertical motion changed into a circular motion whereas in uh, netherlands they were trying to make a circular motion into a vertical motion so that they could have a, a vertical saw which was cutting log it was truly mechanized because their windmills were running all the time their water was running all the time it could run 24 hours a day 365 days a year a country with such a small population as netherlands were making 1500 to 2000 ships every year the water wheel and that is a, a roman uh, mosaic of a pit sawing the pit sawing was there for 2000 years one small innovation change and then you get the circular saw once you have made it like this you make you can make a circular saw and that comes in another 200 years this was the pattern diagram uh, the person who invented it i can give you his name also cornelius cornel zoon that's his name the dutchman who invented it he was a miller uh, he described himself as a poor farmer with wife and children when he went to, when he applied for a patent he attached a whip saw to the uh, windmill and ensured a 24 hour supply of planks the theory that they said was uh, sawyers could process 60 logs over 120 days one sawmill using a wind powered sawmill they could do the 60 logs in 4 days so they were going with a 1500% uh, increase so the next one so what did they do this was a typical ship on the sea uh, uh, they were uh, it was also called something I'll give the name when I come a uh, Dutchman a uh, Dutchman uh, most of the ships if you're making 1500 ships when other people are making 50 ships obviously only your ship would be seen everywhere just like you see a Marathi car rather than anything else here uh, so the Dutch came to India the next one the first one is called New Amsterdam today it's called New York okay they went to New York first uh, the second is, I can't get a clearer photograph. It is a pillar next to Mahabalipuram, where it's a mandabam next to a temple where you have a Dutchman. The full VOC uniform is carved on a temple. They were such a big influence on the country here. So, some, to carve you on a temple pillar, you have to be big. That, of course, is uh, Sedras. In Netherlands, now they have made a typical uh, example of how this worked, though it has been improved. You can see that in a museum, how logs were cut into uh, uh, planks. I saw a very innovative factory in behind St. Gobain here. A log is put, how do you calculate which angle of the log gives you the maximum planks? So they have a computer for that. That turns the log, makes a laser uh, a picture on the side of the log and decides which angle will give you the maximum planks. We have been talking about a lot about vaccines last two years. But we never bother about them, say, five years back. Children could get their vaccine shots when they were small. Uh, but vaccines were one of the biggest improvements in healthcare. What is the point of making a lot of improvements in your life unless you're going to live to be 60? So vaccines were the first elements which actually pushed the age limit of people beyond 50. They were vaccinated earlier and it happened. Vaccines those days, uh, Madras was one of the earliest cities to adopt vaccination. We have a statue for a vaccinator. I'll show you that. We have a statue for a 1700 a vaccinator in Pudupet, Madras, a man who vaccinated. Those days, vaccine was not as simple as an injection. You had to open your skin, put the inoculum inside and make stretches. So, obviously, we were mistaken for a uh, witchcraft. So, a lot of people, actually, these vaccinators were beaten up. Uh, smallpox was one of the earliest things, uh, diseases we vaccinated for. A smallpox could kill almost 9 out of 10 people who had it or maim the rest of them. People would go blind, deaf. Uh, smallpox, in a way, uh, in traditional societies, was looked at as a goddess or was looked at when the social distancing was not there. Just imagine that if you uh, imagine that corona was being caused by a goddess and you had to visit the home of somebody who has got corona. So that social distancing aspect was not there. It quite spread because of that. The Britishers dis, uh, realized that smallpox could eliminate this entire country. And there were a lot of within 50, 60 years of the vaccination starting in Europe, people were being vaccinated in Madras. This King Institute in Gindi, it's an Indo Sarsanic building, where uh, smallpox was eradicated from two continents because of vaccines made here. Madras was one of the top places to make vaccines in the 1900s. World War I time, 
all soldiers were vaccinated africa half of africa was vaccinated with vaccines made in madras that man in those pants those side is called a vaccine uh, uh, rejection officer or something this post existed in the madras corporation if somebody said i don't want to get vaccinated this man will have to go and talk to them so uh, convince them vaccine convincer or something he gets a salary because of that. and that uh, palm uh, script on that side is a very interesting a poem written by an englishman in tamil in tamil in, in chola or pandya age tamil he writes about ellis who is a collector of madras writes a big fraudulent poem in which he talks about uh, we have five elements of the cow in our traditional medicines panchakavyam we say he talks about the inoculum from the uh, cow as a sixth he talks about an invent uh, imaginary conversation between parvati and danvantri in which parvati says only i gave this inoculum to the people so it is legally sanctioned this uh, english collector in madras writes to convince the citizens that they should get vaccinated so it is not easy convincing people to get vaccinated at the moment uh, even when you invented vaccination this is the statue for the vaccinator swami nayak uh, it is behind that avin booth in puduppet once you cross the harris bridge uh, after casino you can see the statue on the right side though it was open recently memories run long people are thankful that swami nayak vaccinated a lot of our ancestors in madras the bicycle of course not for the though there were a billion bicycles within 100 years of invention no other uh, equipment uh, sold a billion pieces after that there are many elements of bicycle marketing or manufacturing no other uh, vehicle was say innovated on so many times within 100 years we got around 20 different varieties of cycles within the first 100 years i would say the greatest achievement of bicycle was inventor of the plane or inventor of the ball bearing or inventor of something else they are all bicycle mechanics even today if you dismantle a bicycle and assemble it you would have learned about at least four of the simple machines you would have learned about so many of those uh, innovative aspects in making a machine the evolution of the bicycle within say 100 years was like this 1820 we have our first electric car there are uh, innovation can be very fascinating the electric car comes before the petrol car uh, we we imagine it as to be something very new and uh, we want to use it the electric car came 40 years before the petrol car and the cycle was parallel to the car as it is the different varieties of the cycle the last one is a fireman cycle before they invented a fire engine this was a fireman cycle every fireman had a cycle so they could uh, cycle up to the uh, where the 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 situation where the fire was the right brothers were bicycle mechanics they even had a patent for a cycle variety uh, before they started and they in, almost all the parts of the initial bicycle of the initial plane were made from bicycle parts i said a man cheated in the bicycle race he beat the next competitor by several hundred yards people were wondering how that was in 1700s it was held in paris they had to cycle something like 15 20 kilometers and this man beats everybody else by uh, 50 to 100 meters people are wondering how he did it he did it by cheating because his mechanic had invented the ball bearing even today none of us would know how important the ball bearing is because we don't even know who the inventor was the ball bearing without the ball bearing the world would grind to a halt today your planes can't fly your space shuttle can't fly you can't go to the moon the world would get stuck the ball bearing was invented by a cycle mechanic to make his client win a cycle race and that is when it took off cycling also had uh, unfairly won the race i'll give can give you his name as well huh? the first man his name is james moore and the first bicycle race in paris to rouen to 1869 and the man who invented the, the mechanic who invented the ball bearing was jules souris the next one the bicycle marketing was aggressive Uh, the previous one we will wait for this was aggressive 10% of all advertisements coming in america was for bicycles these were all uh, indicators of how things were going to change in the near future the people the people started lobbying for better roads so today we are getting better roads because the bicycle lobby started it bicycles help create or enhance new kinds of businesses just like your internet does for your swiggy or your oyo bicycle uh, the the courier boys messenger boys they all started women started moving around to the next villages they became seamstresses governesses went in they who wanted to teach uh, the tuition teachers rather they went around in cycles that was one main reason uh, the church banned 
the cycle. They said it is a contraption of the devil. In England banned the cycle for some 10 15 years before they realized it was very important and they couldn't ban it. And uh, interest in owning your own vehicle rather than going by public transport, which has come to your cars, which is we are having a big boom right now. Cycle was perhaps the first uh, vehicle most of us owned. The light bulb. A light bulb uh, spends 95% of its energy on heat rather than light. It is a very, very, uh, let's say, inefficient machine, which is why it's going to be banned very soon. But at that point of time, five or six people invented it simultaneously. One in England, one in France, three in America. There are five patents for a light bulb. Edison, of course, did a package, including electricity supply and to the bulb. So that's why he's being remembered for the incandescent bulb. The innovation within the bulb, he had already got a very good pump, a uh, vacuum pump to make the vacuum inside. But that filament, he tried half a dozen filaments before he finally settled on a cotton filament which came for 12 hours and a bamboo filament which came for 1200 hours. So all these were innovations. A carbonized bamboo filament is what helped him to make a permanent bulb. The vital uh, aspect of using a bulb in the house was once again after the invention of fire or the innovation of fire changed your sleeping hours. Man sleeping hours to eight. Most of us get only five or six, but <laughs> eight hours, it gets fixed at eight hours after the bulb comes up. Most of the American families, we have to talk about all this because we don't have details about the Indian families. Most of the American families by 1930 had a, at least one bulb in their house. So they could, uh, children will not like it, but homework was invented after the bulb. How could a teacher give you homework if you don't have a bulb? Huh? So they invented that. And effectiveness of a person's working spent till 10 o'clock or as long as you wanted. Night shift started. Industry started working better. One small innovation started, uh, uh, jerked up your efficiency by another 50 to 100 percent. That was a remarkable invention in, in that aspect. Even today, a lot of children don't. In those days, a great man was somebody who studied, uh, studied by uh, the road lamp. That is a typical. I studied by the road lamp and went to USA. I studied the road lamp and became IAS officer. So that is how they used to actually calculate how effective you were. Because you didn't afford to have, uh, in that Thiruvalladal uh, Padathala, Nagesh will tell the Sivaruman, eating on time, such an important thing to show your prosperity. So having able to being able to study at home, having your own light, this is an outlier principle. Uh, this outlier principle that I am frequently talking about is one of the very good theories on how we should bring up children. There is a computer company in USA, 1960s. They have a big computer which is not useful. They want to give it away. Nobody wants it. And one of these officers' wives is a parent-teacher association president. So she says, let's give this computer to a school. So that school is the first school in the world to have a computer. Uh, 10 or 12 children are interested, but most of them drop out. Three are very interested. One of them gets killed in a uh, a hiking accident. Two of them are the remaining people. One of them is Bill Gates. So Bill Gates is perhaps the only school child to have touched a computer in 1968. This outlier principle follows how people are successful. They come backwards. How successful people could have, what could have contributed to their success. Say having a light at home, you don't have to go outside and uh, study. All these are outlier principles. The greatest invention, which puts us all together today the computer and the internet. I'm, I'm, the first is the computer coming into Kanpur IIT on a bullock cart. The computer came on a bullock cart and uh, in Madras IIT, you had to break a wall to keep it inside. The computers are so big. There were four computers in Madras, Shawalas, uh, LIC. Then it was called an IBM machine. They didn't call it a computer. It was called an IBM machine. And uh, one in IIT. Uh, you had to wear socks when you go into the room and the air conditioning. Air conditioning was a very big, uh, people didn't have air conditioning, air conditioning at home, but a computer had to have air conditioning all the time. So, Adhikave, we school children used to enjoy going into the computer room. This was as big as a computer could get in 1970. But today, even your phone is a computer. It's getting smaller. As they say, uh, they make a joke about a transistor maker. He says, he got so successful, he moved to a smaller place. So, <laughs> you a really successful transistor must be smaller. So, good technology is always moved lower. If your phone has a problem, would you go to your grandfather or your grandson? A grandson who is doing his first class could correct it in a minute. The grandfather wouldn't even know what it is, what model it is. So a good technology always moves lower and computers are ideally suited to for the definition of a good technology. And today a phone is a computer. 
the internet was linking computers. We have five computers, why not make them friends? So that is how the it started as an inter-office. It was not meant for this uh, boom that we have today, internet boom. It was meant for an inter-office in a US defense project. And the way it has come out in the public, I don't think any other technology has leaked. Internet has enabled and accelerated new forms of personal interactions through instant messaging. We call it a snail post. See, those days we used to have a postman. The postman is a very important person in Indian history. Say, Rabi Nath Tagore used to write a couple of stories about postmen. He uh, used to have a spear, he used to have a rod with a bell and he used to run. They were called runners. If somebody, if somebody's dog bit the postman, it was an offense against the king of England. It was treated as an offense against the emperor of England. So, postmen were protected because letters had to go on this side and that side. But today, how many of us write letters? We had a program in Madras Literary Society the other day, on Madras Day, because the date was very good and it was a palindrome, 22-8-22. So they gave us postcards to, and asked us to write to somebody. People would think we are mad if we send them a postcard today. So I send it to my grandson who can't read. So, so that is how it, a computer or instant messaging or internet has changed the way we look at things. There is something for everyone. In It's not just about uh, people who fly or people who go to the moon and come back safely that innovation helps. There is something for everybody. I will tell you my personal story. My handwriting was terrible. So bad that I don't want to look at it again. If I don't want to look at my own handwriting, when will a proofreader or editor look at it? So I can't look at something I've written even the second time. Though I wanted to be a writer ever since I was a child, I could not become a writer till the computer came in. The moment I use the computer as a glorified typewriter, I can edit on it, I can type Tamil on it, so I became a Tamil writer. There are so many. I, I The first thing that my Tamil Tamil teacher in Vidya Mandir said was, I wrote a 1200 page novel. It's as simple as that. You can. I type with one la, one na. And uh, correct it globally. All that is possible. You can innovate. Nobody has to teach you. You have to select this word and change that. As simple as that. So, thousand, and uh, there was this girl, Abhirami, who's now passed away, who's uh, one of the well read novelists. Her Vetric Kalir is one of the best read uh, 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 historical fiction. She wrote a novel on her phone. She was a small town girl who didn't have an access to a computer who wrote a novel on phone. She typed it on the phone. I said, I'll send you my old uh, laptop if you want. He said, no, I'm comfortable on the phone. I can do another novel. She unfortunately passed away, but two of her novels are bestsellers. So, a computer gives you access and uh, to re redefine your life. I became a writer. I wouldn't have done it, but for the computer. Uh, 486. On the Galdra 486 was the fastest computer. I started typing on that and wrote my novels. Next one. This is my favorite innovation. I am wearing one right now. I am I'm a diabetic and uh, diabetics, uh, the moment you say you're diabetic, everybody would have some cure for it, but uh, I don't know if it works. So this is a continuous glucose monitor. Say 20 years back, the inhaler was invented for the asthmatics. Asthma, if you know, is a psychological disease. An asthmatic can work up asthma if he just thinks, dust uh, animals are coming, I'm going to get allergic, he can get asthma. It was psychological. The moment you add an inhaler in your pocket, it stopped. The inhaler was actually awarded the best invention of the year in uh, the BBC contest in 1996 or something. So, this is the game changer in diabetics. 8 to 12 percent of Indian population are diabetics who spend an average of 6,000, 7,000 rupees a month getting uh, medicines for that, changing their lifestyle. Any other disease, people look at you with sympathy. But diabetes, they'll always look at you with, uh, with uh, angry eye or an accusing eye. <laughs> You've been eating too much or you're not going, going to your walk here. Regularly. So, this is a continuous glucose monitor. So, I prick my finger once a day and the doctor gives me a dosage. I do a three-month average. Three-month average, if you are having high sugar for 50% and a low sugar for 50%, the three-month average would be perfect. The doctor would say, no medicines required for you. You will get a SBA1C of 7. Exact. So, these are the crazy things that you realize. It's like keeping one leg in the stove and one leg on the fridge and saying on the average you are comfortable. It's not going to happen. This is there is a layer called interstitial layer between your uh, skin and your blood flow. There is an interstitial liquid which is proportionally high and low on sugar to your blood. This is a small fiber going inside and it is put in by an hydraulic uh, force onto your, it sticks onto you for 15 days. It gives you 1440 readings a day. You can see the graph. If you eat idlis, you know exactly how much it has gone up. If you eat those how much it has gone up. There's so much of it because there's so much not to weigh them for the sugar. People say you can eat cinnamon water, you can eat that uh, karanjiragam. Now you'll know within 
six hours whether it worked or not. If somebody wants to do a scientific study on it, they can do. You know exactly how many steps you need to walk. You know which part of the day you are having more sugar, and you learn that you have been overdosed for five to ten years. You have been overdosed. Doctors, just to be safe, have been giving you a lot more medicines and putting you on insulin. So within three months, I am. All, it looks like magic. Say, my father used to talk about a uh, 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 local uh, trader who used to come and sell hair oil, uh, hair growth oil. Nobody was interested. When he was trying to sell, poor apa used to say, "Anna, the pot apna kaiya karu na sir, let kaiya mudi mudi jaro." Everybody wanted two bottles. <laughs> That is marketing. Okay, I am not marketing this, but this point is, it showed me what foods were really bad. Any diabetes asked to eat chapatis. I asked you to try and see a doctor, but eat chapatis. Chapatis were hell for me. Anything which was powdered, I am having a full rice meal in the morning, in the lunch. I don't have any sugar uh, spikes because. Their whole grains. The bigger the grains are, uh, the sugar doesn't spike. These are tremendous things that we are learning in the last three months. How sleep is affecting, how walking is affecting. We can redefine our lives with one small innovation. The problem is in America, it is in short supply. The reason, when you are controlling your sugar, your weight goes down. So all Weight Watchers are putting this on. Weight watching is a bigger market in USA than the diabetic. So it's an actually a scarcity in America right now, but of course you're getting it in India. Only one man has the patent. Abbott has the patent. There are of course groups which buy it from him and have uh, diabetic management groups. So this is some of the, the parts, of the invention which has changed my life so much. Ten years I've been a diabetic. I used to be afraid of going to the doctor because he always used to look at me at an accusing eye. Nowadays I don't even need a doctor. I know what goes up or what doesn't go up. I'm off insulin. I'm half off half the drugs. So uh, life has become much easier. I've dropped dropped four and a half kilos or five kilos, all because of one small amount. It is expensive. It will cost you ten thousand rupees a month. Two pieces will of four thousand nine four triple nine a month. That's the price throughout the world. But a doctor needs this only for a month to tell you whether the drugs work or not. It's very important because I've been spending six thousand seven thousand rupees on a uh, on my medication for the last ten years. This is a game changer, and people are working on. Uh, implants like this for almost every disease. In 10-15 years, man would have controlled most of the diseases that we think are uh, unbeatable because of innovations in the medical field. This once again is by the internet. You can it goes to a common website. They know what's happening. So let us just examine one pathway: England to India. Say so Gandhi went to England. The Englishman came to India. Clive came to India. So there's been a regular passage of people for the last four hundred years. So let us see how it is uh, changed. London to India and vice versa. Five months it used to take the East India Company people to come, and a fifty percent chance that your ship would not hit a pirate ship or uh, sink. Then there was an important uh, aspect called fishing fleet. The British has started. The women were not allowed in East India Company to come to Madras. Only the men could come. Men started marrying local people. So the the government as well as the local people there were very afraid that some of these children would be smuggled back with corrupted blood. That's what they call corrupted blood. One of the East India Company reports says that if we do not control this right now, the royal family will have Indian blood in six generations. Diana has one sixteenth Indian blood. The next king of England has one by thirty two Indian blood. So it happened. It really happened. So when this happened, uh, they decided on something called a fishing fleet. So all marriageable girls of marriageable age, if you want to go to India, they will bring you by ship here. You can spend three months here trying to get a husband. They were fishing for husbands. That's why it's called fishing fleet. They used to be given three hundred pounds as a, 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 a as a expenditure fee. When we read about these histories, some of the girls were very well educated. They were uh, uh, tutors and governesses there, so they they write a lot about this. There's no Suez Canal. They have to come. The ship will come up to the Mediterranean Sea and stop in Alexandria. They will take a a sled. Because wheels can't turn in the desert, they used to come away a camel organized sled to Red Sea, take another ship to Bombay. So this used to take them cut the trip by say another two months. So the Englishmen were coming to India in two months. Then Gandhi took three weeks to go to bomb uh, to go to uh, England through the Suez Canal. That is all uh, tabulated details. Then a flight came. When from Madras you have to go to Bombay, then Aden, then uh, Italy, then Paris, and five stops that you could go there. And then one flight, a non-stop flight. Then the telephone—you could talk to people in England. Then the internet, where you can type immediately. People know you can consult a doctor in England, talk to your friend in England. 
you can watch a, a person from england can watch this program i am giving a talk in a uh, a group of indian doctors tamil doctors in england next week on ponin silvan but uh, that's happening over the internet all this is possible there are so many aspects of life that have improved because of the internet the origins of the internet 1960s a state department of defense uh, time sharing of computers that is why it was started for if i don't my computer is operated fully full time i can use yours when there is spare time it was called the arpanet which has become the internet now it was never visualized as a common man's tool so many facets of life they can win propaganda wars what does a government do when there is a strike or when there is an agitation they cut off the internet so internet today is a revolution mission your arab spring your sri lankan spring all was done by the internet the computer has the typewriter it's like a ever hungry like your katot kitchen who is ever hungry for uh, the badba surana or something who eats human uh, it has been eating the typewriter the calculator the music machine the tv screen your office and the school has now been eaten by the internet so everything has come within the phone as i said a good technology will try to absorb other technology within and the phone is going to make the computer into extinct in a few years the tom as i was talking earlier about i jumped the gun and spoke about my novel writing editing a novel essentially means retyping tom sawyer was the first novel typed on a typewriter mark twain was a big gadder into typewriting he all his uh, articles as well as novels were typewritten it is also has its negative points we are addicted to social media we are addicted to a lot of things now when have 1200 people wished you birthday before say so 10 years back now 1200 people wish you birthday on facebook so it, it says that uh, we have too many friends or too uh, big parts of our brain are locked in that but then you don't have to go hunting daily or like a ancestor or you don't have to hide in caves in the night or climb hills you have that time so internet also makes you the time for that my point is people should be open to innovation uh, all these are not been done by people very lucky people or very big uh, educated people have done this but we need to be open to innovation innovation can change our life we can spot innovations like i did that cgm i researched it on 6 months and i thought it's going to change my life and it did there are aspects all around floating all around you which are begging for your attention they could be a better way of reading or say look at the kindle i i i always have a habit of reading two three books simultaneously a fiction or non fiction something of that sort i couldn't be carrying two three books wherever i went the kindle has 1200 books i can do i can read whichever i want so the way you entertain yourself the way you can be useful to society there are lots of aspects uh, which are innovations by other people which can be superimposed on your own life or on your own career which can make it better thank you hi the teacher Any questions? Just two questions. Usually have. <laughs> I used to be scared of him when uh, I started uh, lecturing those days. <laughs> Not anymore. Huh? I won't call them innovations. There have been innovations in that. Of course, uh, innovations in religion and uh, God is one invention of man or man's uh, which has never changed. Uh, at least you have bigger populations believing or not believing but i think god is one sustainable invention which we need to hold dear to us i always uh, imagine that it could be an invention it's something that came with us a part of our dna but there have been plenty of innovations in religion many of the religions have gone uh, into history books uh, is our in religion the same as what it was 40 50 years back both ways now uh, we have this uh, we used to do the trip for this padal petrasthalam devara sthalangal we have 276 stalam in those days uh, i had to go most of the temples were locked we had to go and uh, wake up the pujari uh, and ask him to open the temple we could do two temples a day today the roads are much better and the invention of the grill gate almost every temple in tamil nadu has a grill gate in which the god is protected you can go have a look and come out even if that pujari sir pujari invariably refused to come so what we can have it and uh, put a tick on your uh, excel chart that you have seen it it's been tourism religious tourism is so popular these days so easy to and 
i think religious texts as well how many of us had a bhagavad gita book now you can switch on the you can have a uh, let's say go on the internet and read it fully gandhi when he goes to england an englishman comes and tells him uh, explain bhagavad gita to him gandhi has to go to a shop and buy his bhagavad gita for the first time in his life he buys a bhagavad gita and he becomes an expert on that he says i don't know but let's all read together the innovations are possible with uh, i think uh, publishing and internet are going to change almost everything i think it's going to be religion also yes sir yes design arts painting you can get a painting like uh, van gogh or anybody so last week there is a big painting competition and a computer drawn painting got the first prize hey ad eppadina you just have to put 20 clue words van gogh like iris uh, in a double decker bus you will get a painting like that within a minute i my son operated it for me and showed it it's 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 going to change the world you just have to give, uh, we always uh, writers we always imagine that our words can uh, create images in your mind they are creating images on the computer 20 clue words and you get a masterpiece painting i asked my son why don't we do this and ask a painter to redraw that you might get a real painting to your test i, I had this question when i was asking my dear sir he said if you say something like hatha chitra kalanka but the computer learns computer is learning right. they are catching up with us right. huh? things that it can give him that idea of a color card so he thinks you know it's going to also uh, help them help them what my question was you know it is kind of democratizing what was mythical bringing it down history. bringing out to the common man Correct. i can do a painting in the style of van gogh tomorrow Correct. if i can type the words Correct. exactly just come to that <laughs> that man wanted to order among 3 300000 entries and of of the 300000 the computer painting had to win it became such a big controversy 15 20 days back ai it in ai or something dream ai dream ai and then the four is gpt3 is the open ai but what i was fascinated was words becoming a painting you just have to give the computer a clue and it will uh, paint no the computer uh, written novel came 20 years back the first novel written by a computer came 20 years back computer plays chess so many just like uh, sujatha writes that computers will take over uh, on i think june all right it uh, the computers take over the world thank you the next one yes thank you so thank you venkatesh uh, this is a typical venkatesh lecture uh, hey a very broad sweep very unexpected things and full of humor right so totally enjoyable so i would request uh, mr murli to come over here and uh, give us a t- t- token of our appreciation to venkatesh on behalf of varahamira science forum murli spoke for varahamira science forum a couple of months back oh good um, so he was on the stage yes. Come to the light. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, thank you. Very nice. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. So, so it's, it's very strange. We are, the Varamira Science Forum itself is an experiment. And we went from, you know, uh, in, in person to Zoom, which most of us never heard of before lockdown. and now we are experimenting with live programs okay and we are, seriously and we are having more technical hiccups here than with the so i apologize for that hopefully we will get that resolved uh, in this thing hope to see you all next month thank you for coming have a good evening